Once again, I'm recording uh, this lecture because somebody couldn't make it to class and asked me for a recording. Hello. Is there some weird sound here? Some tinny thing? Let's uh, see if I can bring that down a bit. Is that better? Maybe if I stand away from this? All right. All right. Good times. Any questions from last time? We kind of rushed bits of it. We're going to go over that bit that we um, uh, didn't finish with the homeopathy because it's always fun. Is that me making that noise? No, it's making noise. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so last time we covered uh, randomized control trials, or a version of them. That's not the end of the story. That's as far as we're going to get, really, in, in, in this class. But uh, recognize it is an enormous part of the science of clinical epidemiology. And again, if you want to build a career here, it's a lucrative career to be had. Um, we talked a bit about randomization, and today we're going to talk more about randomization, about methods of randomization. We talked about blindedness. An open trial is when there is no blindedness. A single blinded trial is what? What's a single blinded trial? This is, this is the easy question. It's a harder one coming. What's a single blinded trial? Who's blind? Yes. Participants. Participants. What's a double blinded trial? And participants and? And what's a triple blinded trial? Ooh, we didn't cover that, did we? What do you think it is? It exists. What do you think it is? Who's left to be blinded? No one knows. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry? Everyone's blind. No, there's some one person left in this in this process that still isn't blind. Yeah. The data collectors? Close. The data analyzers. Right. Now, triple blindness actually means different things to different people. But a consensus is that the statistician is sometimes blinded too. How does that work? It's here's the data from group A, here's the data from group B, e, just analyze them. That often doesn't happen. Usually it's here's the test group, and here's the placebo group, analyze them. Should it matter? The numbers shouldn't lie. Numbers are numbers. But uh, sticklers would argue that every little bit of control helps. Okay, we talked about placebo. We talked about uh, a couple of the things, of the biases. There are lots of biases that affect placebo. One of the most Hawthorne effect, the other was Rosenthal effect. Do you remember what those are? Having been like the third class, you probably heard these terms. Which is which? Hawthorne and Rosenthal, what do they do? Nobody remembers. It's one of the things you have to remember for the exam. Just, just saying. <laughs> yeah? Um, Hawthorne is when you act differently because of That's right, and Rosenthal is? Exactly right. Rosenthal is also called Pygmalion, or self-fulfilling prophecy. Uh, right. We talked about the uh, Cochrane collaboration. I don't really need you to know about that, so don't worry too much about it. It's just for your own benediction. And we talked about methods of judging the quality of an RCT, including the Haddad score and the consort statement. Again, I don't require you to know how to do that. Know they exist, and know that there are quality standards you can apply when in doubt. Okay, first we have some unfinished business from last time. And that unfinished business has to do with this stuff. So all of this really comes down to how we experimentally assess the efficacy of interventions. What kinds of interventions? Drugs, in particular. I mentioned last time that one of the failings of the RCT is its lack of validity. Um, and we'll talk about what kind of validity I mean later on, because we're going to go deep into validity in a second, in that it's such a controlled environment that sometimes we cannot test the fullness of experience, only the specific intervention that we're talking about. So things like Reiki or kinds of Eastern therapies that are all about the one-on-one -on -one relationship um, aren't really disentanglable in an RCT context, because there isn't a single pill or technology or intervention you can distill. Homeopathy, on the other hand, is fair game, because there are homeopathic medicines that we actually can buy in Sharper's Drug Mart now. They claim that it's a drug with a certain kind of efficacy. So we're going to look at the evidence around homeopathy. And really, there isn't a whole lot, in a whole lot of positive evidence. Here's a, uh, this story like this pops up every single year, where someone attempts to kill themselves by overdosing on homeopathic drugs. This was a genuine attempt by this person, who thought she'd actually die if she took all these drugs, which homeopathic drugs are just water. You're not going to die unless you have a lot of water. There's actually, um, in England, they celebrate a day every year, homeopathic suicide day, where all these skeptics take as many homeopathic drugs as they can to show that it's just water and it's just fine. 
And this was a picture I took actually at a massage clinic here in Ottawa. Homeopathic first aid class, which is kind of horrifying. As, um, <laughs> oh, my leg's broken. Let me drop some water on them. First, I'll have to dilute this a million times. So before I mock it too much, I'm going to show you this video. Maybe some of you have seen this. It's from this British show called that Mitchell and Webb look. Ever heard of that? It's a comedy show, and uh, it's kind of cool. So let's watch this. First, we've got to skip this ad. Homeopathic ER, A and E's ER for anybody. What have we got? Um, there was a, a study that came out just last week that was supposedly groundbreaking, and it showed that you know, there is no effect of homeopathic medicine, but uh, you would think that would end the debate. But no. So in my alma mater, University of Toronto, they published a study um, uh, from their pharmacy department saying that 63% uh, of their homeopathic patients being treated for ADHD showed a significant improvement in the primary outcome uh, after 4.5 visits. Okay, so this has created quite the kerfuffle, and all of U of T's Nobel Prize winners have got together to write a letter of complaint to their faculty complaining about the poor science that went into this particular study. Not knowing anything else other than it was a clinical trial, and that particular sentence, 63% has a significant improvement from the in the primary outcome, and knowing your job is to dissect or to look at the possible failings and or strengths of this kind of study. What are the first questions you would ask? Yes? Uh, what is the primary outcome? What is the primary outcome? Good question. Primary outcome here is ADHD. So reduction in ADHD, however that's measured. All right? What else? Go back to your Haddad scores and your consort statements and things like that to see was this a good clinical trial. So what other things do you care about? And these are the things that the Nobel Prize winners actually zoomed in on right away. And by the way, you can see their response by clicking on that link and, yeah. Was it randomized? Was it randomized? Good question. In this case, it was not randomized, and for a good reason. <coughs> we'll get to... I was going to say, like, if they had a big enough population. Like that. Sample size. Okay. Uh, I don't know the answer to that. Okay. But there's no randomization for a particular reason. 
And this is really the crux of the problem. What was the reason? Yes. Because not everyone's going to willingly agree to take one of the capsules. That's true, except it is ADHD, and it's not going to kill you in the short term anyway. So, you know, that or a cup of coffee. So, yeah. The control and case aren't equivalent. You're almost there. There was no control group. So that's why you can't randomize. It's only one group. So it seems like an obvious thing, but it's, it, doesn't, it doesn't jump out from the statement. It should be 60% uh, you know, as compared to the other group, but there was no other group. So obviously, in any group, you can show an improvement if you do anything. We'll get to that in a second. So um, if you read their responses, they go through list by list you know, what the problem of that trial was. And this was just this was in the past year. Yeah. Um, so the history of homeopathy in the randomized control literature is kind of interesting. In 1991, B, am I recording? I hope I'm recording. Sorry, I'm trying to uh, record this as well for website. Check to see if I'm recording. I'm recording. I am, good. And now, also on the recording is me going, am I recording? <laughs> All right. So BMJ, 20 years ago, said that there is some evidence in clinical trials of a positive outcome caused by homeopathic drugs in clinical trials. Now, those clinical trials, if you go back and look at them, are also flawed in the ways that we have discussed already. Many had no control groups. Many had no randomization. Many had no blinding and things like that. That's why we have today things like the consort statement and, and head out scores to account for the quality of these scores. But BMJ was you know, quite um, uh, measured in their comments, saying we just need more studies. Okay? Um, then we found a, a meta-analysis showed signs of major weaknesses in various methodologies. Okay, let's start to show some flaws here. 2005. Clinical effects are nothing more than placebo. Insufficient evidence. Evidence is not sufficient. Blah, 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 blah. However, if you go to the homeopathic websites, and you will see things like this. Um, all the studies are, are clearly prove that homeopathy is an absolute scientific system, and no contest is needed to question its efficacy. Now, that's interesting. So when you haven't got to the science on your side, the response often is, so much study has been done without saying what the outcome of those studies are. It's a, very, it's a common trope to look for. And um, here's the British Homeopathic Association. Four out of five major systematic reviews on RCTs and homeopathy have included with certain caveats something has an effect greater than placebo. All right. To the layperson, that's an impressive sounding sentence. <coughs> greater than placebo. But pretty much everything has an effect greater than placebo. And in the case of this, if it's not a blinded study, what might account for an effect greater than placebo? What? Yes. Exactly. Or it could be the fact that if, if it's single-blinded, um, the practitioner is offering a certain kind of attention. That's actually, we see that a hell of a lot with single-blinded studies. The practitioner is offering um, uh, enough of a, a relationship boost such that the measured outcome is greater than the control group. If you click on the link, though, there actually is no evidence. So that statement is actually false on its face. Nothing is actually cited here. So outright lies are being put forth. The lesson here is you don't trust websites or news articles or even experts, right? You need to read the stuff yourself. Now you have the tools, at least some of the tools. You have things like checklists from Consort and Haddad to go through studies and to um, assess them for yourselves. You have epidemiological skills now that you can apply, right? So. And be aware of, of scientific language. We all say more research is needed because that's how, A, we justify the next grant we apply for, and B, um, that's how we cover our asses to say we don't, we're not sure of everything. We always need more research. But that line is often um, uh, pointed to by lay people as saying, well, the scientists aren't certain. Why should I be certain? We're mostly certain. Right? Bottom line, it's the RCT is the gold standard, but it's not perfect. There's, some, there's always going to be flaws. That's why we have professionals all the time spending lots of money and time making them better and better and repeating them all the time to make them better. There are some profound flaws that affect interpretability and generalizability. Validity. We'll talk about validity today. They're also very, very expensive. So um, there's often little motivation to do randomized control trials on things that won't lead to a measurable financial outcome or things that don't have sufficient public worth to warrant a government investment. 
So you may wonder, how come we don't know whether or not aspirin does this or that? Well, aspirin's off. There is no patent on aspirin anymore, so you can't make a lot of money on aspirin. That's an example. So um, what I'm trying to say is RCTs are pretty damn good. They're our best tool for establishing causality and effectiveness, but they're not perfect. They come with huge caveats. And that brings us to today's topic. So today's topic, we're going to talk about randomization, but also validity. So randomization first. We mentioned last time that um, randomization on its face appears quite simple. It's, you come to me, I flip a coin to see which group you're in. But randomization has a couple of flaws in it. Do you remember some of those flaws, at least with simple randomization? Remember, if, uh, if all of you are in my study and I'm flipping a coin to determine who goes in the placebo group and who goes in treatment group, Balance, that's the big one. So balance means I can't guarantee that I'm going to have equal numbers, and I can't guarantee what else? Yes? Selection bias. Selection bias. So I can't guarantee that certain factors that I may care about that may be associated with the outcome are equally distributed. So there's a term that I'm going to introduce called the nuisance factor. Nuisance factors are things that kind of uh, may be associated with the outcome that I'm not entirely aware of or can't control. Some things I am aware of. I'm aware of gender, I'm aware of age, I'm aware of your medical history, things that I think are relevant to the study at hand. And I can take efforts, and I'll show you some of those efforts, to assure proper balance and equal distribution of those factors. Nuisance factors I can't be entirely certain of. Nuisance factors could include things like maybe you have a genetic disposition that I'm unaware of. Maybe you have, maybe you're adopted and don't know your family history. Maybe on the day that you're going to get treated, uh, a certain technician is being an ass and, and disturbing you. Maybe the weather's going to be bad on some days uh, where the placebo group is getting good weather. Who knows? I can't control these things. And so by randomizing, hopefully, I'm causing a somewhat equal distribution in nuisance factors as well. Okay, so back in the day, it was difficult to do randomization. Today we have computers. But believe it or not, as recently as 25, 30 years ago, we actually had books of random numbers. The most popular ones are published by the RAND Corporation. And RAND is not short for random. It's a coincidence. So it actually have massive books with just random numbers. And what you do is you like, you'd, you'd roll a dice. Is it die is singular or dice is singular? Dice is singular. Die is plural, right? Two die, one dice, yeah? All right, you roll, you roll a dice, and, and it'll tell you which, which page to go to. And then you like you roll another dice, and that's how many lines down you get, another dice, how many columns over, and that's your random number. And maybe that number will take you to another page, depending on the algorithm you've chosen. So there, there are many levels of randomness that go into it. Okay. So that's a very complicated process needed to, to assure allocation. And you may say that if my eventual random number is an even number, then that's the one then that means that this patient I'm looking at will go into the placebo group. If it's an odd number, they'll go into the treatment group. So you see how, how this works. We go to extreme gymnastics to make sure it's as random as possible. Today, we don't really need to. So today, we have something called random number generators that we sometimes use, that computers will kick out. There's a, something philosophically interesting, and that is that a computer really cannot produce a random number. Did you know that? Is that odd? Right? Computers produce something called pseudo-random numbers. There's actually, again, a random number dictionary in the memory banks of most computers that a pseudo-random process plucks from and gives you something that resembles, to all intents and purposes, something that's random. So it's sufficiently random-ish that it, it resembles a random number and it's good enough for a clinical trial. But it isn't really, because if I've run an exper uh, a computerized experiment a billion times, I will eventually see a repetition of patterns because randomness is not possible. Philosophically, that's interesting, isn't it? If a computer can't produce a truly random scenario, maybe there's no such thing as random scenarios. That's kind of creepy, isn't it? If there's no such thing as randomness, then there's no such thing as statistics, in which case this is a waste of time, this entire class. Fascinating. Anyway, randomization. Our goals when we're randomizing, and by the way, here we're talking about random allocation, not random sampling or random selection. Do you remember the difference again? We covered it last time between random allocation and random selection. 
You remember? You're nodding. What is it? Say it again. Uh, Be that person. That's right. Exactly. Uh, and I, I know I'm being repetitive, but it's an important distinction to make. So random selection is when I'm choosing a sample randomly from a larger population, and whatever I do with that sample, I infer those results to that larger population. Random allocation is when I have a clinical sample, and I need to allocate to one group or the other. We're talking about random allocation here, oftentimes called randomization. So our goal is to eliminate bias, primary selection bias, as was mentioned. Our secondary goal is to assure, to some degree, equal balance. And balance means somewhat equal numbers in, in the various arms. We call them arms in clinical trials. And also, the fact that we have a random allocation allows us to select certain statistical tests that rely upon the assumption of random allocation. Right. I mentioned the difference already between randomization and random selection. And there are all kinds of different methods that we use. So if I'm doing random sampling, one of the common things to do um, uh, when needing telephone surveys, if, I call, if I'm a telephone survey and I'll call up your house and there's a bunch of you living in that house, I only want one of you from that house, one thing you do is to ask for the person who had the most recent birthday. That's called the birthday method. Pretty straightforward. Or if I'm sitting registering subjects for a clinical trial, let's say in the ER, right? And um, uh, you're coming in the ER and I'm trying to register people and say, what part of this say do? Great, we have established now whether or not you're part of the treatment group or the placebo group. And if your birthday occurred within the last six months, you're in the placebo group. If you're in the next six months, you're in the treatment group. Do you see a problem with that method? Do you see a bias that may manifest? Yeah? Right, exactly. So if, if the thing you're trying to measure, the outcome, is a seasonal kind of disease, then it may be something that's somewhat statistically related to your age or when you were born. I can't think of an example, but it's a possibility. So we don't like that one that much, but it's sometimes done. Another one is a data presentation method. And that is, again, if I'm recruiting people at a hospital, let's say, uh, and I'm there all week, I can decide that on oddly number of days, you're going to be placebo people. On even number of days, you're going to be treatment people. Do you see a problem with that method? It seems kind of random, doesn't it? Who knows what day you're coming in? If you happen to come in on the 10th of, of March, you're going to be in the placebo group. If you happen to come in on the 13th, you're going to be on the treatment group. Is there something systematically wrong with that approach? Yes. Mm, no, but you're thinking. It's good. Yes. Could it be that something happened on that day? Like maybe something yeah. happened on the 10th? Sure, absolutely. Who knows why they're coming in? Maybe there's a flu clinic that day. Maybe there's something extraneous to the hospital environment. Maybe like the, I don't know, there's cheaper bus rides on that day. Therefore, I'm getting a certain kind of, of demographic. I don't know. So the things about days that you can't control. Also, these two methods kind of violate um, one of the things we really want for randomization, that is the inability to, to predict who is going to be next. Right? So um, I, I want to know as a registrar, the registering person, the next person who comes through the door, when I say come through a door, I'm speaking figuratively. They're not usually coming through a door. It's a process by which the next name that lands on my desk. I want to not know whether or not they're going to be in the placebo group or the um, treatment group. In this case, I will know. If it's on an even day, I'll know that everyone that day is going to be in this group. So the less I know, the better. These are um, examples of systematic allocation. So systematic allocation is when there's a systematic process by which you are allocated to one group or another. It's not random. It's random to the extent that maybe the reason you came in that day was random. I don't know. Probably not. But it's systematic to the extent that I have a system by which I'm choosing you versus you. It's not ideal. Yes? It could also affect the balance. It could, well, it could affect the balance. Not necessarily. Because I could say, um, I'm only going to take 100 people today and tomorrow 100 people. It will affect, though, my inability to have a balance in nuisance factors. Because who knows, maybe the people coming in today were all had free daycares. So they're all mothers of small children. 
that's a nuisance factor I can't control for. So we have uh, uh, two types of randomization that I'm going to show you. There's simple randomization, also called complete, and block randomization. And as a variation on block randomization, we'll look at as well. So simple randomization is what we all think about with randomization, the coin flip. You're coming to me one at a time, I flip a coin, you're here, you're there. And we already talked about that it doesn't guarantee balance, it doesn't guarantee um, equivalence of nuisance factors and so forth. Right? And we say this is particularly problematic with small studies. What's small? 200 is small. Anything 200 or smaller, in general, a coin flip will give me imbalanced arms. If it's more than 200, in general, the laws of probability show me that I'm going to get something kind of equal, but you know, I can't guarantee it. This is the easiest and most intuitive method, obviously. We all understand a coin flip. Block, however, is a little bit more complicated. With block randomization, we are randomizing blocks of people at a time. Okay, so there's a, there's a saying that goes, uh, block what you can, randomize what you cannot. And hopefully this, this will be clear in a second. With block randomization, we are trying to, as much as possible, guarantee balance and guarantee equivalence when it comes to a variety of potentially confounding factors, including nuisance factors. And I'll show you an example right now. So let's say we have, don't worry about that so much, we, we covered all the stuff where we talked about um, simple versus uh, uh, with the imbalance in arms when it comes to simple randomization. Because we're doing simple randomization, it's really bad luck if we have unbalanced samples. It's possible to have really horrible luck and get like all my people over here and none of them over there. It's rare to have um, equal distribution. So that's all that's saying over here. But for the purpose of block randomization, the example, let's say that we have two treatment groups. Um, so A is the one that's getting the drug, and B is the one that's getting the placebo. So these are the ways in which A and B can be randomly distributed for four people. So for any four people that come to me, I can either get, um, to get equivalent distribution, the first two can be A, and the second two can be B, or have A, B, A, B, or the first one can be A, the next two can be B, and the last one can be A, and so forth. Okay? So in other words, there are six different ways I can arrange four people such that two of them get in A group A and two of them get in group B. How does that help me? It helps me because now I can choose randomly between these six options. So for every four people that come to me, I can randomly choose how they will be blocked. So if you are the people that I'm trying to enroll into my study, four will come out to me first. I'm going to roll a die, dice, die, what is it, dice, whatever dice, one to six, and I'll go through here. Uh, whatever one I get, let's say I get that one. So you four, you'll be B, you'll be A, you'll be A, you'll be B. Next four come up, roll a die again, and I get one. So next four, you'll be A, you'll be A, you'll be B, you'll be B, and so forth. Why? How, why do I do that? What's the magic there? Yes? Right. The, uh, the arms will always be balanced. I'm guaranteed to A, get an even number of people, because I'm taking you in fours, B, to always make sure I have equal numbers of A's and B's. And C, anything C's? Yeah, that's it. <laughs> that's the balancing. Okay? So, this is the example I just showed you. I roll a die, s, dice, die, die, I don't know. Let's look it up. Is it dice or die? Anyone know? Yeah, die is single? Really? And dice is plural? Die is plural. <coughs> liar. Okay, dice is singular, <laughs> die is plural. Okay, so that's wrong. So I roll a dice, and I roll a three. So three gets ABBA. <laughs> so for my ABBA, it's A, B, B, A, and so forth. Right? It's possible to have um, a, a one, two, three, four, five, six person block and roll a, um, uh, and I'd have more variations there. I probably have to roll a 10-sided dice. We do have 10-sided dice. If you play Dungeons and Dragons, you know we've got multiple-sided dice. But this is the easiest way, because usually we've got A's and B's. Okay. So we can stratify a randomization as well. Um, when you stratify a randomization, you choose the thing that you care about, maybe a confounding factor, and you create strata of that confounding factor. For example, let's say I'm worried that men and women will respond to my group in different ways, respond to my drug in different ways. And so ideally, I want to make sure there are equal numbers of men and women in both groups. 
if I were to simple randomize, I might get that. I probably won't be guaranteed an equal distribution. If I block randomize, I still won't get that either, because for block randomization, I'm just doing A's and B's, and that, that corresponds to placebo and treatment groups. If I stratify, what I do is first I randomize the men, then I randomize the women. In other words, I create strata, strata's layers, of the factor that I care about. Okay, so the verb there is stratify, or break down by. Right? So you randomize the men first, women first. If it's age, you randomize the old people first, then the young people first, and so forth. Again, you block what you can, randomize what you cannot. So I can block or stratify by sex, so I'll do that. Okay, can I combine blocked and stratified? Absolutely I can. I can create a block system for the young people, and a block system for the old people, and a block system for the men, and a block system for the women, and so forth. It gets complicated very fast. So the more potential confounders I identify, the more strata I need, the more blocking st uh, strategies I need, and so on, and so on. There's, again, an entire science of randomization. My first stats prof was one of the founders of something called cluster randomization. And cluster randomization is when you have clusters of populations that you randomize first, and within each cluster you do further randomization. I don't really understand it. But that was, he made, became famous as a cluster randomization guy. So again, there's all kinds of work being done all the time to develop new methods of randomization that increasingly reduce types of bias, because people are just obsessed with removing types of bias. For the reasons you can probably imagine. All the debates in the media around, does this actually work? Well, I don't think you have enough evidence. Fine, what do I have to do now? You know, more RCTs and so forth. Okay, so that's uh, what we have on randomization. Before I move on to something else, everybody clear on randomization? I know you're not. I know you're lots of questions next time. But right now? Okay, good. So we talked about how one of the problems with RCTs was that as controlled as they are, they don't really reflect the real world. And that's an expression of poor validity. When we talked about screening tests, do you remember that we talked about um, um, screening tests had a certain definition of reliability and validity? Reliability was, the, if I did the test more than one time, do I get the same results a lot? Right? So a test is reliable if it gives me the same result every time I do it. A test is valid if, in fact, it is detecting the thing that it claims to be detecting. So a pregnancy test, is that valid? Well, a pregnancy test is actually testing a level of hormone in your urine. Okay? It's not detecting pregnancy. So it has limited validity, really. That level of hormone is closely correlated with degrees of pregnancy, but it's not that thing, really. If I'm giving you your exams at the end of, of, the, of the semester, is that test valid if I'm attempting to measure your ability to do epidemiology? Probably not. I'm testing your ability to write exams. Right? If I give you an IQ test, am I testing your intelligence? Not really. I'm testing your ability to write IQ tests. And so forth. So um, we're going off on a tangent there. When we have studies rather than screening tests, reliability means exactly the same thing. Reliability is, does the study, if I do it over and over again, give me the same result? Validity, on the other hand, means the extent to which my conclusions that I draw from my study are, in fact, warranted in the real world. And there are various kinds of validity. We're going to go through them right now. Have you covered this in other classes before? Types of validity? Okay, good. So we'll be mostly review for, for a lot of this. That's good. So as you may recall, validity is divided into internal and external validity. Internal validity is about whether or not the variables you have measured are accurately expressed in terms of their relationship. So is the truth of the relationship that you've measured, is that real? On the other hand, external validity talks about whether or not the relationship that you've measured is applicable to the community that you care about. It's entirely possible to have internal validity and to have poor external validity. Let me think of an example here. Um, let's say you are doing an administrative study on a, a company around whether or not, uh, on the, the relationship between income, salary, and uh, work habits. Okay? And you find from this company's database that the 
that the, the employees who work the hardest are also the employees who are paid the most. So you conclude that um, there is a causal relationship between if I pay you more, you're going to work more. Is that valid? It's not. It's not valid. Why isn't it valid? So again, the data suggests that those employees who work the hardest are also those who are paid more. I erroneously conclude, invalidly, that if I pay you more, you'll work more. What could actually be going on? Yes? Could be. What else is going on? What other reason might there be for that observation? That those who are paid the most are also those who work the most. Yeah. Work the longer, absolutely. Or maybe if you work harder, you're being paid more. You're being rewarded because you work hard rather than you're working harder because you're paid more. So I've made a faulty conclusion based upon um, my data. So the relationship I perceive is not an accurate one. That's poor internal validity. With external validity, ex okay, this is a good one. External validity, let's say you are done, you're trying to figure out a way to reduce smoking rates in greater society. And you have this idea that, I don't know, I've put up posters around the university campus. And the posters will show all of the studies that have been done showing how bad smoking is for you. And you'll detail them all and says, look, this guy did a randomized control trial, this guy did a experiment. And look at all this shit that show that if you're smoking, you're dropping your life expectancy by 10%. And you put this around campus, and sure enough, you discover at the end of the year that smoking rates have fallen by 20%. Uh, now you want to roll out this strategy to the entire city because it works so well on campus. What is wrong with that strategy? Yes? Exactly. So it has internal validity because the relationship that you observed on campus was real. The students did stop smoking as a result of seeing these things, let's say. Okay? But it's not applicable to the rest of the city. So it has poor external validity. So it's possible to have good internal validity and poor external validity. Is it possible to have poor external validity and good internal validity? No, oh, other way around, right? Is it possible to have good internal external validity and poor internal validity? No, it's not. You must be good enough here before you can be externally valid. Okay. Oh, look at that. It's all the stuff right. So internal validity, really, we're talking about has confounding been accounted for, right? So if you're looking at causal relationships, all we really care about are three of Bradford Hill's criteria. Temporality, covariation, and non-spuriousness. So temporality is, did the cause precede the effect? Did the um, yeah, getting more money precede working harder? And that example, it didn't. Okay? Um, is the strength of the association strong? In that case, it was. Has non-spuriousness been accounted for? Non-spuriousness is, are there other relationships we could consider? In the example I gave you, non-spuriousness was violated. We found, in fact, it could be that people were working harder and thus got paid more. Right? So that's a, a classic case where internal validity has been violated due to two factors there. With external validity, often it's violated because we are too specific. In the, in the example I gave you, we're very specific around who is capable of accessing and understanding the intervention. These posters detailing epidemiological studies. Yes. In your example before, if you wanted to like use your study to apply to other campus, then would that? Sure, they would probably have good external validity there. Okay. Um, so the, uh, the placebo effect and Hoffman and Rosenthal effects are classic violators of external validity because placebo effect is a real thing. You're actually seeing an effect caused by your intervention. Hawthorne and Rosenthal are just enhancers of an effect that is real. So because they're real, the internal validity is solid. But because they're also biasing your findings towards a certain direction, external validity is not good. Okay. Now, qualitative studies have their own version of external validity. 
Remember, qualitative studies are about me talking to some people and, and wondering um, uh, what kind of insights it has given me about people as a whole. We, they don't use the word uh, externality, they use the term transferability in that case. Okay. Again, this is not a qualitative course, so that's all I'm going to say about it. Transferability, that's, that's the result. Now, there's something called ecological validity, which is very similar to external validity, but it's distinct. So ecological validity is when the environment of your experiment or study is substantially different from the real world. It's possible to violate ecological validity and not violate external validity. It's possible to not violate ex uh, ecological validity and violate external validity. In other words, the two are not related at all. They sound very similar. Okay, so here's an example. Um, if we're going, if the law faculty is going to do mock trials, instead of mock trials, instead of juries, they're going to go through actual um, um, people will have people pretending to be a jury, but instead of saying I I vote for guilty, they'll, they'll write down their results. Okay, so I'm here, judge. I think he's guilty. I think he's guilty. Whatever it might be. So that has poor ecological validity because if the idea is to simulate a real-life courtroom, it has failed to do so. In a real courtroom, you sit in a box and you shut up, and then maybe at the end the lawyer will pull you, whatever it might be, or you go in the back and you take a vote and you hand one thing to the judge. But in their simulation, everyone is writing things to the judge. Okay, so it's not valid as an estimator or a simulator of real life. On the other hand, they find that their results as they simulate these real courtroom cases are actually the same as you would get in a real courtroom. So it is externally valid in the sense that what they've learned is applicable to the real world, but is ecologically invalid in that they have not simulated the real world accurately. Okay? I can't, I can't think of a way to explain that more clearly. But you will confuse the two, guaranteed. Okay. It's very common in psychology. In psychology, a lot of the tests, of course, are, are in simulated environments. I can't really simulate an extreme physical assault on you without actually creating, creating a crime. So we do other ways of doing so. Okay. So the difference is external validity is about the ability to generalize to a population. And ecological validity is when my study does not resemble the real world. So the heavily controlled nature of RCTs implies poor ecological validity. Does it then imply poor external validity? Well, that's the debate. That's the discussion. Okay, moving on to a new topic now. We have two towns. Rewatville and Gomez Land, two favorite places in the world. And let's say Rewatville receives a radio broadcast on how to boil turbid water. So um, both communities suffer from bad water quality leading to endless amounts of diarrhea, wonderful things like that. Okay, and they don't know what to do about it. So turbid water is water that looks kind of gross. Okay? And the thing to do with turbid water, like I think last week parts of Gatineau had a boil water alert. Yeah, that's, that's what we're talking about here. And no one knows about that. So, so Ray Whiteville received a radio broadcast on, on how to identify when your water is bad and how long to boil it and therefore how to be safe. Gomez Land does not receive that radio broadcast. And afterwards, after a month of this, we compare the rates of waterborne disease in both cities. What kind of design is this? Is this a randomized control trial? It's not. Why is someone shook their head? Why isn't it a randomized? You shook your head there. Yes. Why isn't it? Because you're not controlling that. Because I'm not randomizing. Okay. It is a trial of some kind. It is an experiment. Why is it an experiment? Yes. Because I intervened and gave them the broadcast. Absolutely. It's a special kind of experiment. It's called a quasi-experiment. Right? And this is an exceptionally common kind of design, particularly in global health studies, because it's cheap. If I've got communities of hundreds of thousands of people, I'm not going to be able to randomize them. On the other hand, they're there. We've got two towns. Let's have some educational intervention. Let's have a, a visiting you know, drama team to talk about HIV. Is that a hand? Yeah. yeah. Could you argue that like, um, cities or whatever It's a glorious metropolis, Raywalk Village. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. Um, could you say that like the glorious metropolis? <laughs> 
The, the population might have been randomly selected, but the unit of analysis here is the rate of waterborne illness, so it's an individual analysis. Right? So if I were to use, if the unit of analysis was the population, what kind of study would this be then? It's been an ecological study, okay, which has all kinds of other issues associated with it. It's a good question though, but I've only got um, two populations here. I haven't randomly selected 20 communities from the sea of a million cities in the world, that would be more of an ecological study, I've got one. Within that thing, I've got a bunch of 100,000 people who are undertaking this quasi-experiment. That's what makes it a quasi-experiment. The 100,000 people in here, whose rates of waterborne illness I'm now going to measure, were not randomly selected. Is it possible that someone's got a cousin over here and told them, hey, I'm listening to this radio show, right? And you should boil your water, is that possible? Of course it is. So I can't control for the pristineness of, of the message, of the intervention. I can't control con for confounding at all. So internal validity is completely lost here. When, at the end of the day, I find out that this group has a, a lower rate of waterborne disease, I would like to conclude it's because of my radio broadcast. But the lack of internal validity kind of makes that hard. On the other hand, is it externally valid? What do you think? Obviously, I've put into jeopardy internal validity here. Well, first of all, is it ecologically valid rather than external? Yes? I can't Absolutely, because it is the real world. It's not just simulating the real world, it is the real world. Is it therefore externally valid? Um, Again, there's a debate to be had, right? I would argue that it is quite externally valid. We'll see. So why would you choose a quasi-experimental design? Well, they're enormously inexpensive, and sometimes randomization is not possible. So when I was uh, consulting with the provincial government, we did a lot of randomized uh, quasi-experimental designs to evaluate educational and mental health programs. That's their favorite way of doing things. So let's say you've got a policy in, you know, in various high schools that we're going to, um, uh, a policy you want to test out on anti-bullying in high schools. Well, you select a couple of high schools to have that policy and a couple of high schools that don't have that policy and you see which ones have lower rates of bullying. Can you blind it? Can you blind a quasi-experiment? Can't, obviously, because they'll know what they're getting and you'll know which ones you gave to. In um, a uh, situation that size, you can't really mask any effects of that nature. I can't think of any examples in which there's blinded quasi-experiments. Maybe you can. But quasi-experiments, don't knock it because it's got poor internal validity. Quasi-experiments are enormously powerful and, and, uh, and popular. And if you type in quasi-experiment in PubMed, you'll see thousands of hits, all of which are fascinating papers. Okay, what's a natural experiment? You've heard that term, you hear it in the media pretty much every day. Let me tell you a story about my favorite natural experiment. Is that a hand first? Back there, is that a hand? Is that, no, is that a yawn? Okay. Mm. Suspicious. Okay, so my favorite natural experiment was, remember I told you about that job interview I had with Atomic Energy Canada that I didn't get because I didn't remember the formula for, uh, right? So the other thing that I screwed up in that job interview and remember, the job interview is about, about uh, diseases resulting from radiation. And I was so arrogant. I didn't even do my homework when I walked in there. And they said, right, um, obviously we can't expose people to radiation to test out the effects. So can you think of the natural experiment, the most famous natural experiment that allows us to know what the population effects of radiation are? And you know, not no, this was like before Chernobyl. I'm old, remember? <laughs> before Chernobyl, what was the big one? Yes. There it is. You guys get it right away. I, I, I don't know. If I, yeah. So yes, so, so um, the atomic uh, bombs on uh, Nagasaki and Hiroshima were obviously natural experiments that are unfortunate. We don't like it that it happened, but it happened. And so we can look at the effects of those, of, of, of those interventions and learn something about radiation. So knowing that that's an example of a natural experiment, what is a natural experiment? Yes. 
Well, atomic bombs are man-made. But you're, you're almost there. But I didn't make them. I was the investigator. I didn't do it. I'm just showing up after the fact. I didn't do this shit, but I'm going to look at the data. That's what it comes down to. So it's like a quasi-experiment, except the researcher didn't manipulate the variables. Somebody else did. All right? So the allocation of variables kind of happened naturally. So a volcano might explode in that city. It didn't explode in that city that is comparably sized and has got the same gender distribution, age distribution, culture. And I'm going to look at the effects of volcano smoke on this community versus that community. I didn't make the volcano explode. It just did it. So I don't feel that guilty about it, but I'm going to watch it anyway. So that's a natural experiment. It's not quite a quasi-experiment because I didn't do it. But how is that different from a cohort study? For example, because in the cohort studies, when things manifest naturally, yeah. Cohort studies doesn't back in No. <laughs> we have to have a talk, young man. <laughs> How's it different from a cohort study? Yes. There's still an intervention. Yes, there's still an intervention. So a cohort study, let's say. If people naturally were gravitating towards the volcano, <laughs> then that would be kind of cohort-like. They're out of their own behaviors. They're doing so, or you know. Um, but there was some kind of intervention. Somebody manipulated a variable here. It wasn't me, but someone did. That's what makes an experiment. So the example here is: we have two communities with similar demographics. One has a smoking ban, and the other doesn't. So is that a cohort study or a natural experiment? It's a natural experiment because a smoking ban is an artificial thing. A variable has been manipulated by an external force. In this case, it was a community government. And I'm just looking to see what the outcome is. Right. One could argue, in this case, that maybe it's a quasi-experiment because maybe I am the government as well. But that's a, you know, that's a slippery argument. The point is there are different kinds of designs here. And guarantee you, before the exam, someone's going to come to me and ask me again, what's the difference between a core study and a natural experiment? I say, look at the slide, look at the slide, it's there. And download the podcast that I'm recording now for this very purpose. Okay, so there it is. The one I got wrong, that job interview that I haven't gotten over 20 years later. Okay, moving on from experimental designs. Something new. So let's say you do a physical fitness test on 100 random people. And you rank them from least fit to most fit. Right? And let's say you take the 50 poorest people, ones who are the least fit, and a week later you test them again. What do you think you'll see? What will happen to those 50 people in the few days that have passed? Or the, yeah? They would do better, absolutely. And what about the 50 best people? What will happen to them? Sorry? They'll do less well, they'll do worse. Why is that? It's because of this weird thing called regression to the mean, also called regressive fallacy. Hopefully you saw this in your stats class. If you didn't, you're seeing it now. Okay, because it was first uh, discovered by Sir Francis Galton in 1866 when he was measuring the heights of children. So he took the height of the mother and the father, and the heights of the child, and he figured out that the child, when they grew to adulthood, were always somewhere in between the height of the mother and father. Magic, right? So he figured out that people tend to regress heightwards towards the average of their parents. We have taken that observation and, uh, uh, and extrapolated it to look at clinical data. So noisy data tends to reduce in its noise as time goes on. What does that mean? Imagine we're doing a, uh, a clinical trial. And, and I'm doing a trial on, let's say, if my new drug reduces the severity of asthma. And I'm going to enroll some asthma people, right? So I've got a bunch of people in my asthma clinic, and I'm going to get 20 of them. And which are the 20 do you think that will agree to be part of the study? What are some characteristics of the 20 people who will agree? Will they be feeling good? Will they be suffering from asthma particularly bad? Well, what will they be? Yeah. They'll be suffering. The ones who are suffering the most are probably the ones who really be part of the trial. Like, I need something for my trial. 
The thing about regression to the mean is, over time, most of them are going to get a little bit better anyway, because that's noise in the system. Extreme behaviors tend to modify over time. Not always, but they tend to. Right? That means we're going to have an artificial sense that our drug is doing better than it actually is, when in fact what we're observing is the natural tendency of people to get better anyway. And to take this back to um, the observation of uh, uh, alternative medicines, is there's no saying prior to this century that most of medicine, whether it's Western or Eastern, was just holding your hand and making you feel better as you get better anyway. Because most people's diseases get better anyway, regardless of what the clinician does. With the exception of drugs and surgery, medicine necessarily doesn't do a whole lot for you, says the epidemiologist. Right? <laughs> and a lot of that has to do with our tendency to regress back to basic sustainability. Okay, so here's the variation regression to the mean. It's uh, variables extreme on the first measurement, later measurements are likely to be not as extreme. Okay. Last slide is your homework, very simple homework. And this is actual data from the famous Salk trials. What is a Salk vaccine invented for? What does it treat or prevent? Yes? Polio. Polio, that is correct. Shame on you if you don't know that, health science students. The Salk vaccine is for, for polio. So um, in this famous uh, trial, there's a bunch of school children. They were randomized into 200,745 people who were vaccinated and the rest received placebo. I want you to create the contingency table. And here are the data for the, who got um, uh, cases in either group. And compute the relative risk. Also state the null hypothesis. Very simple. I want to see if you can get it right. That's all. That is all. Be gone.